Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly, and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I call my son. Then Herod when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. So just a warning, uh, today's topic might be a little bit heavier than usual, because we're going to do something that a lot of people don't really do at Christmas time. Uh, we're going to talk about a tragedy that happened shortly after Jesus' birth, and the guy at the center of it all. King Herod. So around 1300 to 1200 years before Jesus' birth, God's people, the Israelites, were slaves in the land of Egypt. You may know the story of the Exodus, uh, where God partners with Moses to bring his people out of slavery and into the promised land. It's a really common story, even for people who aren't religious, but sometimes we gloss over some major details from that event that the Israelites would have never forgotten. For example, if you've ever been in Sunday school, you probably remember a story about a little baby Moses that gets put into a basket, or in Hebrew, an ark, which is interesting. But he put, he's put in a basket and he's sent down the Nile River by his mother. Why is she doing this and why isn't anybody stopping her? Well, it's because she's just following the orders of the Pharaoh who had it out for the Israelites. In the first chapter of Exodus, we learn that this Pharaoh felt threatened by God's people, and to help him rest easy, he did two things. First, he had them all enslaved and forced to work on his building projects. And because they were the ones pouring their blood, sweat, and tears into building up Egypt, you better believe that these people weren't about to let themselves or their children forget about all the things they went through. God even sanctioned an entire holiday called Passover to memorialize this entire Exodus event. And there's a meal that you eat during Passover with different elements that reflect on the story. And there's actually a part of the meal that refers to the mortar that the Israelites used to help build Pharaoh's kingdom. And next, he ordered for all the midwives of Egypt to kill any male children born to Israelite women. And these midwives were smart and they were a little cheeky and they found a way to avoid doing that. But Pharaoh still wanted it done. And he commanded all the people to throw the newborn sons of Israelites into the Nile River to lessen their numbers. And in doing so, he also lessened the threat to his crown or headdress thingy. 
I, I don't really know what they call it. Actually, it's called a Neems. Neem, yeah, Neems. I just looked it up. And you wouldn't just forget about something as tragic as this order that Pharaoh gave. It's baked into the Passover meal, and it's just a major part of the cultural memory and identity of Israelites and Jewish people even today. And after the Exodus, this entire event is just marked in the minds and the hearts of the Israelites. And in their scriptures, which as, as Christians are a part of our scriptures too, Egypt becomes this archetype for a wicked and evil nation that's at odds with God. So you might be wondering, Logan, you just read the Christmas story, and then you took this hard left turn into talking about the Exodus and Pharaoh. And I promise you I'm not just rambling and that this is related, but I do think it's important as Christians that we remember the Exodus story because you never know when it's going to pop up and be echoed in the New Testament. So tying this all back in with the Christmas story, if you know how the Old Testament ends, this once great nation of Israel has just gotten back from exile in Babylon, and now it's this tiny province called Judea that's being ruled by the Persian Empire. They didn't have a king, although their prophets said that they would eventually, and at the moment they are working on trying to be as faithful as they can to their God, being back at home. Now a lot of stuff happens in between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. And here in the first book of the New Testament, Matthew, we have this really bold man claiming to be king. What's that all about and who is King Herod? Well, Herod the Great, as he is affectionately titled, was the Roman approved regional king of the province of Judea. He was able to come into power because, first off, his dad and Julius Caesar were buds. And then on top of that, he had a lot of support uh, from Big Brother over in Rome. Outside the Bible, we know that Herod wasn't a very nice man by any stretch of the imagination. He had uh, one of his wives and a couple of his children killed, which seems to kind of fit well with the character that we see in Matthew's Gospel. But for all it's worth, Herod was a pretty great architect. If you're a Bible nerd like me, you may know that the temple that Jesus hangs around in when he's in Jerusalem isn't the original temple. That one was destroyed a long time ago by the Babylonians before the exile. But when they got back, the Israelites and Jews were trying to rebuild that temple, but it looked nothing like what it used to. But when Herod came along, he took that modest little temple and he gave it a facelift. And although you can't see the temple anymore because it was destroyed in 70 AD, if you go to Jerusalem right now, you can see the temple complex that he put together that was one of his major architectural projects. Another thing about Herod was that he has a claim to fame because he moved a mountain. Uh, he basically had workers take an entire hill and move it bucket by bucket to another hill to make a small mountain that he then built a palace on top of, which you can visit today, called the Herodium. And if Herod wasn't already a friend of Caesar, at some point he may have bailed out the Olympic Games that were going through a major financial crisis, which I wasn't even aware of until I was looking some of this stuff up. All in all, Herod was a very powerful and very violent king who had some major building projects going on. And if you aren't picking up on the similarities here, Herod sounds an awful lot like that pharaoh from Exodus. And this news about a Messiah, this God-appointed king being born, makes Herod look a lot more like Pharaoh because he doesn't want that threat to his crown. And he's not the only one worried about this Messiah because the Bible tells us that all of Jerusalem was worried too. And Herod calls in these prominent religious leaders that help run the city to get some information straight concerning the prophecies that the prophets gave about this eventual king. Now, these priests were the ones that were responsible for going before God on behalf of all of the people of Israel, and they were making sacrifices for the people in their place, and it was their job to be models of what God is calling his people to so that the rest of the Israelites could follow suit and become a kingdom of priests. And these scribes and teachers, they were the ones who taught the Torah, which is that thing we talked about a couple weeks ago, the law that God had given his people. And it was their job to help the people understand what their scripture said and what it was asking of them. 
And both of these key religious groups are a little worried about this possible king, which is kind of crazy if you think about it, because of all the people in Israel, these should be the ones that are the most excited about God continuing to unfold his story. But whether it's because these people were benefiting from the system and they didn't want to see it messed up, or whether it's because they were afraid of what Rome might do if this liberating king that they knew about was a legit thing, they were really quick to give this very paranoid and very violent Herod all the information he wanted. And those very scriptures that these religious people were so well versed in just tell the story of God working with this group of people so hard to make them into a faithful nation that trust and obey him that work for justice and mercy in his name. And although there are a lot of high points in the story of God's people, there are also a lot of low points. And it seems by the time that the New Testament picks the story back up, we're at another low point again. And it's not only the religious and political leadership that had become like Pharaoh being at odds with God, but even the people of Israel and the province of Judah seem to have lost sight of the bigger calling and mission that God had given them. Just think of the way Luke talks about the nativity story. Mary and Joseph have to go back to Bethlehem for a census that Rome declared. And obviously there's going to be a lot of people in town because everybody's traveling. And there's no room in the inn for Mary, the very, very pregnant lady. And in a culture that was supposed to reflect God's love and hospitality, Nobody was willing to give up their room for the woman that was literally about to pop. Instead, she gets the bottom floor stable where the animals sleep. It seems that everybody from the leaders to the common people traveling had lost sight of the bigger calling on their lives. They're not acting like Israel anymore. If anything, they're acting like Egypt. And to seal the whole deal, Herod eerily walks in the footsteps of the pharaoh by having all of the male children two years and younger killed because one of them that was born in that area threatened his crown and remember egypt is supposed to be this archetype of a nation that's at odds with god it's evil it's wicked but in the christmas story god tells joseph that it's safer for baby jesus to grow up there than in the very nation that's supposed to be worshiping God. And I'm not going to try to sugarcoat it or anything. This is a really dark part of the nativity story, and so often it gets passed over. But I think we should talk about it because, one, it happened. And two, it directly challenges us as people and as groups and leaders who are claiming to follow God. This entire story presents us with people you would expect to be God's rock stars. You have the citizens of his own capital city. You have the people that work in his temple. You have the people who know and teach his law. But instead of being faithful and loving their God and fearing him, they drop the ball from the top of the totem pole all the way down to the bottom. Instead of seeing humility, we see selfishness and pride. Instead of seeing righteousness, we see so much bloodshed. Instead of seeing men that fear God, we see men that fear other men. And instead of seeing hospitality, we see a pregnant woman that's forced to sleep in a nasty stable. This story shows us how ugly it looks when God's people don't do what their God has asked them to do. As we move closer to the end of this Advent season and the end of this year, I want us to really be challenged by the ugliness of this story. First, we need to search out our scriptures and we need to become more acquainted with what it is that our God has asked us to do in the first place. We need to figure out what it looks like to be the Israel that God is calling all of his children to be. Second, we need to look into our own hearts. We need to look into the lives and hearts of our congregations and our churches of our families, of our leaders, and we need to be honest in asking the question, is there any Egypt in here? Is there anything going on that makes me look less like a citizen of heaven and more like God's enemy? And finally, we have to turn away from those Herod and Pharaoh-like sins and realize that there was a rival king that was born on Christmas and that he, to this day, calls all of us to be a part of his 
better kingdom 